of us up, players and playettes. Today's episode is with Maurice Ashley. He's a grandmaster in the game of chess. He was the first black grandmaster in the game of chess when he achieved that status at 33. Today's conversation rocks. It is uh, just a heavy hitting conversation on, well, it's a thinking man's game. It is the thinking person's game. Chess is. So I shouldn't have been too surprised that the conversation was going to be really deep from a thinker himself. The conversation touches on honing the ability to maintain tension in life and work, but specifically in the game of chess. It talks about going into the uncertainty and being able to actually sit with uncertainty being one of the most important qualities to become a grandmaster. And the longer that you can sit with that uncertainty, the the better you are as, as a chess player. We talk about his journey and all of his uncertain moments. We talk about a, a devastating moment in his life before, right two years before becoming grandmaster, where all of the doubts rushed in like a tidal wave. We talk about all of these different aspects and the mindset that goes into becoming a grandmaster and the metaphorical intimacy between chess and life, all of that with Maurice Ashley. So without further delay, let's get into it with Maurice Ashley. This is Below the Line. Maurice, thank you so much for joining me. No problem. My pleasure. My pleasure to be here. This is, I've been looking forward to this. I told you this, uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a few weeks now. And, um, and the right off the bat, I want to get into your story and, and the stories within your life that have helped shape you. But before that, I want to, uh, I see the Bobby Fisher book right over your shoulder. And I remember when I was a kid watching, uh, searching for Bobby Fisher, I was about the same age as, as the kid in that that movie i just finished watching queen's gambit and there's something so seductive about the it's almost like watching sports you can watch mastery of a of a character in a movie or watch mastery in action when you watch chess or when you watch lebron james but what do those what do those movies or shows get wrong um about in, in their depiction of of a, a chess master. You know, I got to say these, those two in particular that you described, Sergio for Bobby Fisher and the Queen's Gambit, those two are special for really? making sure that they brought on board serious chess consultants, people who care a lot about the game and who don't want to see you get screwed up, depicted by Hollywood in a way where you're thinking, oh my God, chess is not like that at all. So for both actually, Searching for Bobby Fischer and Queen's Gambit, they had Bruce Pandolfini on. And Bruce Pandolfini has been in the chess world for, I want to say like 60 years, dude. Oh, wow. he, he was around in the Bobby Fischer days in the 70s when Shelby Lyman was putting up chess pieces, uh, getting moves from tele, with, by teletype from Reykjavik and putting chess pieces up like magnetic pieces or demo boards you know, wow stuff today you're like what are you doing and and uh so he's been around and then also queen's gambit had gary kasparov come on oh and gary kasparov was one of the best players in history and he made sure that like, all the chess was tight so when you look at it you feel satisfied because you don't feel like they they skimped on it they skimped on mm. the budget they made sure they got the great people to come on and and gave that inner side to what the chess journey is about and of course there's some hollywood stuff that gets thrown in you got to slow things down in some ways that might that may go faster or speed things up that might go slower what are some so examples of those of those things that when you watch it, you're like oh they sped that up if you're in the middle of a game normally you're not going to move very quickly uh, mm-hmm. as as fast as the players might go around, right so film only has this window to do things. Mm-hmm. So you'll see them play a game out, a sequence out really fast, and you'll say, well, that, that would normally take like four hours. <laughs> but really? it all gets depicted in 10, 15 minutes. You can't have a four hour game get played. So they have to transition in certain ways and even the thoughts uh, 
even the moves, individual moves, nobody comes up with that fast. So mm -hmm. I think that's really where you'd see, you saw many of the issues. Some of it is fictionalized. Uh, actually, Queen's Gambit is all fictionalized, but they brought in some real concrete true elements, names of players and the like, but then they would make up the names of other players who never played against those players. So you can see when the inconsistencies are there. But the average folk will not catch that, and it doesn't really matter for the dramatic impact of the shows. Is there anything when you watch it that you wish it, that these types of depictions would go further into? Or do you feel like they really satisfactorily kind of uh, show the game of chess? I got to tell you, you know, as far as the Queen's Gambit especially, the Queen's Gambit had much more time to develop the storyline than Searching for Bobby Fisher did because it was a whole Netflix series versus a single movie. Mm -hmm. And and frankly, movies just always are going to get things pretty wrong. People in a person's life are in a journey or even something that lasts a year and do it all in two hours. Like that's just not true. It always has to truncate these stories and give you a certain arc so you feel that while you're in, a, in this two hour journey. While Queen's Gambit could expand it out because it, it was right. uh, six or seven episodes and we were able to, to give a little bit more room to breathe and, and get into the inner workings of the character. Uh, so I think for what it was worth, as far as Queen's Gambit being a fictionalized depiction of, of the chess world, that they got it spot on. Walter Tevis, the writer uh, of the book, was fantastic in getting the chess world right because he was a chess fan. Mm. And, and then when you look at the people who decided to, to create it, like flip it into a Netflix series, I'm amazed by how consistent they were with wow. the book. I mean, that, it was amazing. That is so really cool to hear. That. that is so yeah. cool to hear that you can really, you can get a satisfaction. An actual chess grandmaster would say, this is, this is not uh, just a complete, uh, fictionalization that they really get a lot of that that inner journey um, trust right? me usually people get chess wrong so many times you're like oh my god the pieces are set up wrong <laughs> the moves that they're saying are artificial the board is is 90 degrees off and you're like could they have at least just call up any chess club and say could you take a look at this we're just putting this right. down no let's just send you a, a, a jpeg just look at it and tell us if this is good yeah they don't even do that. And then people look at it and, they, and, and you look at it later and you go, what the hell? It's terrible. Yeah. It's imagine, imagine you were playing basketball and instead of you know running a full the long way, you go to the short, <laughs> right? The short one. Like you don't do that. Like, you would never, you would never make that mistake, right? You're like, right. what are they doing? You never right. do that. Uh, or or you're watching same thing with basketball. You're watching and you see character who's supposed to be LeBron James and he doesn't dribble the ball. He just walks and takes like four or five steps. And, <laughs> and you, and you see that you, you'll see that in you, Hollywood depictions in, in other, in other things. You'll see stuff yeah. like that. And you're like, I can't believe <laughs> it's real. I can't, I can't yeah. watch this because there's, there's just absolutely no respect for the game in any way. And if it was a traditional game, like people are used to like basketball or football or baseball, Everybody would be pissed off, mm. but because you don't know any better because it's chess, the, the larger audience doesn't know, but the people who do know are sitting there like, I'm, I can't watch it. Mm. Like, this is ridiculous. Please, please get off this chess scene and go to something else because you got to screw this up. <laughs> You've lost complete faith in the entire production at that point. Yeah. yeah. All right. I want to get to um, a few a few more foundational questions or the actual foundational questions of your story, but just real quick, one more thought to pursue on Queens Gambit. Is there any, it made me curious, are there any performance enhancing, you know, in any, in any way, um, compounds that people would take for chess over the last, you know, hundred years, um, or in the last, you know, 10, I imagine they're looking for every edge that they could. So in, Part of me thinks it's an outlandish question. Part of me thinks that, um, you know, you're performing at that level. Why not look for every edge you can get? You know, I'd say there probably is uh, anything that's like five hour energy, right? Something, some you're, you're, you're playing chess for six hours, let's say at a time or mm -hmm. potentially. The average game lasts about three and a half, four hours. 
but you're playing potentially for six hours. I played as many as eight hours. Yeah. So you want to be able to maintain that focus, that concentration over all that period of time, because it's just simply not easy to do. Right? right. So I never did anything like that. I always felt like natural was the way to go. But I think that given all these potential performance enhancing or, uh, you know, not, not exactly like muscular, but certainly cognitive enhancing your alertness uh, cognitively. You probably, you, I mean, what, what did they do in the old days? They drank coffee, mm -hmm. <laughs> you got the coffee out and you made sure you were sharp, you were alert and you could stay, stay on the ball. But I think probably these days, I know at least one of the players, uh, is endorsed by five hour by Red Bull. Oh, excuse oh, me, really? by Red Bull. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I don't doubt that people will do stuff like that within certain bounds. And in fact, the International Chess Federation, because they were trying to become a part of uh, the I the Olympic Committee, the mm -hmm. IOC, that they started saying we might test you guys, and they started testing chess oh, wow. players for performance enhancing drugs. Whatever that meant, and yeah. people were irate when they were like, "What? Are, what are you talking about? What are we going to take exactly to play better chess?" Yeah, but they were serious about it because the IOC insists that you do. Oh, I bet those Russians, those Russians are sneaky. I bet they're that government's trying everything. And if there is something to, that would enhance it, they they're probably the first country to figure it out. You know, I'm not going to trash the, trash <laughs> my Russian friends that right. way for something that that probably is. Has been true over the yeah, years. Yeah. But no, let but, me uh, do it. Let me let me cast that uh, unnecessary yeah, doubt over there. It. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you do it. Um, I'll send food after you. Yeah, exactly. I'm just starting the misinformation campaign. Um, yeah, plus, I, plus, the Olympics, the Chess Olympics are in Moscow next year. I'd right. like to get my visa so I can go. <laughs> right. Okay. There you go. You're in trouble. You're on record for uh, denouncing that. Um, okay, so on on your story, before we get into the the background, and I, you mentioned inner journey, and I really want to I really want to touch on that in this conversation. It's the purpose of the entire project of this podcast. But real quick, for listeners that don't know, um, some basics: what is a grandmaster in chess, and what are the different levels you have to achieve before that? A grandmaster is the highest title you can get in chess. And the way you do that is in competition against other internationally ranked players, which will include grandmasters, international masters, and masters. It's a title that is international. So the International Chess Federation has to confer it on you. And they do it based on your opposition and their ranking. Mm. So I try to compare it to, let's say you want to be an all-star in basketball. Mm -hmm. No one is going to, to have a rating in that way. Uh, in basketball and in basketball you get voted in by the fans and all that mm -hmm. crap if we had to do it with the chess equivalent you want to be an all-star you would have to go head to head against lebron james and james harden and steph curry and all those gangsters to prove that you belong in that group and that's how we get the grandmaster title we have to go head to head against those top elite players who already have the title and get a good score Obviously, if you score 50% against those animals, you belong in that group. Mm -hmm. So there's a mathematical formula based on rating, your rating and their rating and the rating average that's pretty complex, but it boils right. down to you've got to prove that you can hang with this group in a set tournament. And it's just generally tournaments. It's not like you, like they isolate you like in a dojo, take you in a cave somewhere right. and say, okay, now let's see if you can hang. Uh, it's in a tournament, you play, and whoever you get, you have to show that you can compete uh, quite well with them. Wow. And then do you get multiple bites at the apple over many years, and it's just like a continual just climbing that mountain? Or is it you kind of like... Prove it. Yeah. You have to prove it in three tournaments. Mm -hmm. So one, it's like it's like you take the bar for lawyers. You take the bar, you can pass the bar, and you're done. In chess, thank you. You pass the bar, but we're going to give it another, give you another one, and we're going to give you another one. And let's see if you can do that three times. And unlike the bar, it, you know, okay, maybe the questions might change a bit in a bar exam, but in chess, you're constantly seeing different players. And not only that, the, the questions in chess are trying to 
trying to kick your ass. Like right. that's you know, a, you know what I mean? It's not like it's not like the bar, oh that question has an answer. It's right. I'm a grandmaster and I'm trying to crush you. Forget about you ever becoming a grandmaster. We're gonna squelch your dream for all time. Right. right. So you have to prove yourself in a competitive environment where like the questions are changing as you come up with your best idea. Yeah, okay. I'm fascinated by that uh that process, especially just the the psychology that would go into that um, as a chess as a chess player was it was it kind of like a singular goal of yours to become a grandmaster? Was that it was? I imagine it would absolutely. be. And absolutely, I wanted to become a grandmaster. Grandmaster is the highest title aside from world champion, which I also wanted to become. Every grandmaster wanted one at one time to become the world champion. Basically, mm. like you don't you don't have the talent level and the drive desire, passion to become a grandmaster and the work ethic to become a grandmaster without somewhere in your mind thinking, maybe I have what it takes to be the best player in the world. At some point you realize, okay, then there's the best player in the world. And then there's the rest of the players mm -hmm. and you can work all you want, but usually there's going to be like one LeBron James, one Michael Jordan, right? One Tom Brady. And a lot of the people were very, very close, but not, not quite there. Right. Uh, but to become a grandmaster, absolutely. That's just like, uh, got to get done. And I wanted that since I was a teenager in Brooklyn when I first started reading about strong chess players and grandmasters and these famous names like Bobby Fishers and your Jose Raul Capablancas and your Alexander Alakines and just a great legend of the past. And I was a fan of the, the current legends at the time, like Gary Kasparov, for example, who was the best player on the planet. And you just just like, I want to be a grandmaster. That it just That's what it is. What does it take? And so to go pursue that goal with all my heart and soul is what the journey was to, to get to the point that I finally got to. Okay, I've got a handful of questions about this. Um, so that are just popping into my head as we as we chat. You achieved Grandmaster when you were a 33, is that right? Correct. And is that about the average age? Is, is, that, is there kind of a range or sweet spot that it just takes, you know, umpteen years to even get in that conversation and then around your know, 30s mid 30s is that uh, typical not at all oh really it's all over the Atypical, map typical old geriatric almost frankly oh really a grandmaster at 33 uh usually when you talk to any grandmaster they started chess when they were five six seven years mm -hmm. old right they started playing in tournaments when they were eight nine years old pretty much at the latest mm -hmm. i didn't start chess until i was 14 so my first tournament was as a 15 year old. Mm. By then, most grandmasters back then are already like international masters knocking on the door of becoming grandmasters because the average age was about 18, 19, 20. Oh, wow. Like that kind of age because grandmasters, they're prodigies. They're like gymnasts, mm -hmm. right? You're, you, you're start, you start when you're young and you pursue it like a maniac. The problem when you start getting older is because the game didn't have a lot of money in it, or that's shifting now, but certainly back then the game didn't have a lot of money in it. By the time you hit a college age, you start, you need to make a decision about your life. And if you're a pretty smart kid, you're like chess, no money, fun, but no money, uh, life, uh, your business and other stuff may not be as much fun, but I can make me some money. I'm smart enough. I could go into anything and make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of chess players pivot at that point, talented players, and go for the money, go for making a life. Because they can't just be chess bums. It doesn't, doesn't work. And there are chess bums. So you, you got to do something about it. So for me to have started at 15, 15 in a tournament, it's thoroughly impractical for me to think as a beginner at 15, mm -hmm. essentially a beginner, to be thinking that one day I'm going to make this a, a, a professional life, right? That, that's, that's just foolish. Mm -hmm. But I was obsessed. So I tried to blend studying chess with college and it was, it was a very messy mixture. I'll mm -hmm. tell you, it was not easy because ch you're supposed to be studying chess. And then if you're doing college, you want to get all A's, right? Well, I didn't get all A's because I was studying chess while going about the business of getting a college degree. And uh, very fortunately, I ended up coaching chess, getting a job coaching chess, and that was able to pay some bills while I pursued my goal. But again, the path was circuitous. It took way longer than average people would normally take. Uh, finally, I actually got a sponsor when, when I was in my early 30s, like 30, when I had just turned 31, 
I got a sponsor. So I was able to pursue chess only at that point. I was already an international master knocking on the door. Uh, it had been a long journey, but eventually I ended up getting the title. Bring me to Maurice's inner thoughts in your college ages when you're thinking in that fork in the road of chess over uh, passion, over practicality. What was what was that fork in the road like, or what was the, that internal dialogue or external dialogue with with people you trusted? What was that like, and and how uncertain was was it when you chose the the path of of chess? There was no fork in the road. Really, my mother said, "You're going to college, and that's it." <laughs> okay. And I was like, "Okay." She said it was sensible. It's the right thing to do. What's this chess stuff? Where's the money? So for me. College was what you were supposed to do. And especially coming out of my neighborhood, I came out of Brownsville, Brooklyn. You know, life, I was a smart kid. I went to a good school in Brooklyn Technical High School, one of the specialized schools in New York. So the expectation from my high school, all my high school friends were gonna go on to college. We were sort of the gifted kids. And that was the expectation. You were, you were studying so you could become something special in life mm -hmm. and not be and not fall through the cracks and and use that opportunity you got that a lot of your friends frankly growing up in the hood were not going to have mm -hmm. so for me it was a, a, almost a requirement it was a bit of pressure whether it was peer pressure or parental pressure that that said the direction to be a, a college student and get a degree and hopefully that's your ticket to success and it was real. Well, at the same time, I was like, I want to be a grandmaster. <laughs> like this college stuff, uh, this education stuff, I get it. But really, I'm, all, I, I'm trying to play chess. And, and so I did school because it was obligatory, essentially. But I studied chess because I wanted to. It was my passion. And, and I just didn't stop. I just made it work. I just, that was the blend or tried to make it work as best I could the blend of doing what I was passionate about and doing, you know, school. College is almost like elementary school. You had to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not going to tell your mom you're not going to elementary school. So I just did what I what I had to do and get the grades and, and get the degree. In fact, it took me 10 years to finally graduate because oh, wow. I stopped at some point, started taking one class a, a semester and just the slow boat because I was really into chess by me. And what, was there any uncertainty about choosing that path or was it... It was just like, no, burn the boats. This is the only path we're, that, that I'm going down. Or was there, was, I would imagine there could be these internal doubts of, of that, that path and that choice, but maybe not. I really had no doubts at all about wanting to play. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, the, the, the Grand Master title was, was a necessity. Hmm for my soul. I mean, you have to understand when you're that passionate about something and you feel like a chess player, and I imagine it happens for musicians. I imagine it happens for professional athletes. There is something when you find the thing that you love to do and you wake up every day, which even today, decades later, I wake up and I'm thrilled to look at chess. Like, mm -hmm. I, I come up with some idea and I go, whoa, that's, nobody's doing that. Nobody's doing that. Let me do some research. And I jump into the database and there are almost 9 million games in the database. And I start doing a search for this idea that just struck me. And one, once I have it, I should be doing something else. You know, I might have to sign some papers, or whatever. And I'm thinking, that can wait. Wait a second. I, I got to look at this. <laughs> I got to look at this. And then I just get caught looking at this esoteric idea that frankly nobody's looking at and i feel so so uh attached to a creative creative juices start flowing i'm laughing because the discovery really is meaningful and i'm just having so much fun with it and that's even today and i don't play anymore uh I, there's no competition forcing me to do it you know i can just chill and, and hang out on the beach but that's my fun so when when that passion it catches you that fever yeah, it could burn out at some point, particularly on the playing side. I don't feel the need to compete. But just the love of it makes you want to go. And at that time, I really wanted to compete. 
And so what was school doing for me and for my competitive side, for my creative side, for, for having that passion? It just wasn't because mm -hmm. I was learning stuff. You know, people, stuff was being fed to you, but it wasn't that giving, giving, it wasn't satisfying that drive and that ambition to excel at the highest level at this, this location or, or passion that I had chosen. It's, it reminds me of, um, you know, as founders of, uh, of companies and that's, you know, uh, most of my friends here in California are founders and I've been a founder since uh, senior year of college and it's very similar. It's just, I'll hear people say startups are risky or the riskiest thing to do. And it's just, it, it just, I'm like Teflon to that argument because I'm like, no, it's, it is, it's the least risky thing to do for how I'm wired. It is, it is where I feel completely aligned with every piece of, you know, fiber of my DNA of what I'm, what I'm wired to do. It was never risky to do, could to do, do anything startup related. It was almost, it was almost like, no, I need to feed this or else my, my soul will starve. And, and if I'm not feeding, if I'm not feeding that, then it is the hunger pangs of, of my soul 24 hours a day. Uh, so yeah, going two or three days. Uh, yeah, and I think feeding it. I think that's such a good point. Risk. What is what is risk? What is the downside there when somebody says this is risky? The downside that they're implying by almost by definition is that this thing might fail. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what risk is. Because if there's no failure, then there's no real risk, right? So mm -hmm. what they're saying inherently is this thing might fail. So then the question becomes, what is your tolerance for failure? Mm -hmm. That's the real question. It's not, it's not about whether or not it's risky. It's how can you tolerate failure? Are you ready to tolerate failure? Right. And if you say, yeah, I'm ready to tolerate failure because this is the thing I want to do and failure is not going to kill me. Failure is what's going to make me think again and wonder, how do I do this a different way so that I can make this work? Or what do I need to, how do I need to pivot so that I can take the lessons from this so-called failure and be successful? And I think the, that process is really specific to people who want to be successful in life uh, in, in that way, because we, we iterate based on what we see fall apart and how we fail. That's, that, that's how we are wired to be successful. When I play a chess game, when I lose the game, I'm not sitting there thinking, chess sucks. I shouldn't be playing chess. I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? What did they do right? And how do I get better from loss? So losing becomes learning. A lot of people who don't want to go through that. They'd rather just sit at a, a desk and very predictably type in some stuff into a computer. And mm -hmm. when they're done, they know the stuff is in the computer, it's done, give me my paycheck, and I can hang out on the weekends with my family, and that's my fun. I'm not wired like that. That's, mm -hmm. you know, in that case, there's no risk. There's no sense of loss. You're constantly and maybe incrementally changing the world, but in a way that there is no risk, there is no failure or worry right. about failure. Right. So for me, it's like, okay, you can live that life. I would slowly die. Mm -hmm. I can't live that life. I need, I even need the possibility of failure to feel alive. Mm. Like that's part of the fun. Like you get there, you go, okay, that didn't work. What now? That's part of the fun, the question of what now? What's the new solution, the creative solution you have to come up with? And that's so deeply satisfying when after a number of failures, you come up with that solution and, and it's just rocket fuel. You're like, wow, and nobody ever thought of it. And, and you're sitting there and this is gonna work. And it's just a beautiful thing. So that creative process, I think you have to, you know, you just have to have the, the psychological tolerance for failure beyond risk. Risk is you know, the extension of risk is failure. And, and, and uh, if you have that, then none of it is risky because all of it leads to the great path that you're after. Yeah. Well, I, th and I think that's a, that is a brilliant articulation that, that it, it, when we say risk, what we mean is, yeah, this uh, potential for fail for failure with, there's a bit of an unconventional question, but you mentioned this tolerance for failure um, and almost, uh, almost, a pursuit of the potential for failure, uh, being on the other side of, uh, uh, of that, what would you say your mental superpowers, you know, chess is the, the thinker's game. 
what would you say you you just have as as these mental superpowers that allowed you to become a grandmaster, a master of that craft? Well, grandmaster, a grandmaster of chess has to have various qualities. One of the biggest qualities we have already discussed, and it is the tolerance for failure. It is even the tolerance for endured failure, enduring failure. Uh, I've seen a number of talented players in my time, prodigies, kids who are amazing. They can, they just have the brain for chess. They look at a chess board and they see the patterns like Beth Harmon and Queen's Gambit. Just, they just look at it and it's like, I get it. But what happens is sooner or later they face off against other young people who have that same talent. And now the question becomes, well, we, we both can see the board pretty quickly, but are you somebody who's ready to sit down and prepare openings for hours and hours so that you can be ready with traps and ideas that your opponent won't be prepared for? Are you somebody who's ready to go through the physical regimen that you, you need to go through that, that, that fitness training because games will last six hours and if you're not fit, you're gonna fall apart it's five hours in, six hours in, and these are games that are going, it's not just one game, you have nine games, you got nine days of that. I tell people, it's mm -hmm. like, imagine preparing for college finals. And imagine you have to take two college finals back to back and imagine you have to do that nine days in a row. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, no, no, thank you, right? You're gonna, you're gonna, your brain's gonna be fried at the end of it. So you have to be physically ready, mentally ready. And when you get a setback, you have to be ready to deal with those setbacks because you might lose a game, it happens, but you have to bounce back and continue to play. And the nervous tension as well, can you sustain that nervous tension and make that your life where, hey, I don't care how it, it's cut, it's, it's one move and you're dead. It's a, you're, you know, nobody wants to always walk on that tightrope. Right. We chess players at this level, we love walking on the tightrope. Like I want to walk really? on the tightrope Every day, that's the point, right? Really, wow. Front of it. And the guy's trying to push you off, or a woman is trying to push you off the tightrope, and you're like, let's go. That's where I want to be. I don't, not only do I want to be on the tightrope, I want to be on the tightrope with somebody who's trying to push me off the tightrope. That's fun. So you could have talent, but if you don't have those additional qualities, it doesn't help. It doesn't help to get to the highest level. So, so just about every grandmaster has that. For me, I think one of the skills that I have is the ability to easily digest and even articulate after that complex information. So I see the information, but it's, and not only do I see one strain of information, I can then see how that could be applied in a multiplicity of ways in various settings. So you don't just memorize one strand of data and say, oh, this is a fact, you know, about this. It's like if you had the table of elements and you said, uh, okay, so hydrogen is the most basic and you, you find out about the, you know, the one atom uh, for hydrogen and then, you go, and then you keep going to helium and then you memorize that. But can you somehow extrapolate from that and see the whole periodic table? Now that's mm -hmm. a whole different way of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. So that ability to take something that is abstract uh, and looks data-driven and take that and turn it into a concept, turn it into an idea that's more applicable to broader situations or even situations that are totally unrelated. That's something that I'm able to do pretty quickly, mm -hmm. not just in chess, but pretty much anything I look at. So that to me was my strength. And then, then I can articulate it back, which led me to being a commentator because I can explain it to people who have no clue what that is and they'll be like oh well, that makes sense and that is they, and that is so rare to do it and to know how to do it well enough to articulate and communicate it to others it's i imagine that's why you you probably felt natural as a coach because you really yeah. understood it so well you could break it down for for others but that's that's you know it's usually not the same person that can do both that's right that's right and i you know like that's you, you see that all the time, obviously. So you see people want to hear from the best. A lot of times the best can't explain. They just, 
they just do it. Mm-hmm. And and they don't even want to explain it necessarily. Right. So right. Michael Jordan would be like, I don't need to be a coach. <laughs> right. You're the best ever. You can explain, you can make your players so great. And it's not clear. You know, Michael was Michael. I mean, that's he was obsessed and that's what he that's what he was about. And he was also gifted athletically. So a lot of times you see people going to the coaching ranks, like again, basketball is my favorite sport. So I use those examples, like the Larry Bird, for example. Mm-hmm. But Larry was Larry, right? And you, you could watch your players miss. And you're thinking, man, I could probably go out there and do this right now and hit those shots, right? Right. I did that in my prime. That would be nothing to do. Yeah, because the best don't always have that extra skill, that patience also to just allow their players to do what they do. When you were uh, back to 23, 24, 25 year old Maurice, um, when you felt like you were on the other, you were over the hill. And there are other grandmasters being in, inducted as grandmasters at 19 and 20. What was that psychological toll like? What, or, or did you even did that even cross your mind when you're 27, 28? Like, fuck, I'm I'm out of the running, and this is the singular goal I'm obsessed with. Absolutely, and you know, you start talking about that age because by then I had met my future wife. Uh, she was pregnant with a child. Mm. life came fast and hard like hey i was i was 20 uh, i was 27 uh, when reality like knocking daughter on the way right Mm -hmm. Uh, that changes a person's priorities pretty quickly because you know this this chest thing where you're just kind of floating and not worrying about money and and all responsibilities you can just take care of yourself and and really pursue this thing that goes out the window when there's a life on the way. It's like, okay, wait a minute. I got to, I got to provide some stability for the family. So then I really went hardcore into coaching. I really went hardcore uh, more so into commentating and put chess on the side for a minute. And then I would play chess tournaments. I don't know, once every few months and not make it my all in kind of deal because it was hard to balance both. Right. Waking up with a baby uh, crying for, for some milk. And, and the missus was saying, uh, your turn. Right. <laughs> you're, you're not thinking about chess. You're thinking about being a dad. So that combination was extremely hard. And I would go to tournaments when I get a window of time to be able to play in a tournament. And I'd see these teenagers who would play a game, go out that night to the club, come back early in the morning mm-hmm. from partying all night, crash, go to sleep, wake up. I mean, I'm literally going to breakfast I see them crawling in with the same clothes they had on the night before. I'm like, what, what's going on? Oh, yeah, I was partying. What? <laughs> How are you doing that? I couldn't right. do that in my late 20s with, you know, as a dad and a guy who's waking up earlier now as opposed to chess players who tend to sleep late till 10, 11, 12, uh, even later, frankly. So I saw it as a different side. It was a different psychology at, to that, at that point of what I could – what I could do. So yeah, I saw that. And I did feel by my late twenties, like there was something, is this, is this a pipe dream? I still wanted to do it, but it was getting harder and harder and harder to make come come to reality. Was it, what was the moment uh, or window of the most uncertainty in that? Uh, Cause it still was six more years until achieving the goal. The most, uh, is going to sound curious, but the most, devastating moment for me was when Tiger Woods won the Masters in 1997. Oh, wow. How come? I was 31 years old and he went in April of 1997, Tiger wins the Masters. And he is fed in for great reasons. A young guy who is clearly one of the best in the world. And I mean, but he was not yet Tiger. He was, mm-hmm. he was like, that was his coming out party. Mm-hmm. And I saw that and I understood there were no African-Americans in chess who had gotten to the Grand Master title. And I was going to be the one. I was the hope, if you will. And I hadn't done it. And here came Tiger in golf, where there were very few African-Americans. And here he was a breakout star. And I was sitting and looking at myself, uh, looking back at this younger guy and saying, 
wow, look how special he is in what he's doing uh, and, and really representing African-Americans in a beautiful way at the highest level. And the pressure that was on me from all the African-American chess players who, who, were, who would watch and say, Maurice, do it for us, do it for us. You know, even though I was trying to just do it for myself, that pressure was real and, and I hadn't done it. And I knew I could do it. So that was a, that was a low point for me. I was proud of him and you know, a little, little bit, uh, I wouldn't say ashamed, but, you know, sad Ex- for myself. Extreme uncertainty or. Yeah. It's like, what, how was I going to do it? How was I going to make it happen? Because by then, like I said, I had a, a young family and responsibilities and I didn't have the financial resources to be able to make it happen. Uh, what you need, you need to be able to, to hire coaches. Uh, you need to be able to travel to these tournaments all around the world. All of that you have to do while also paying bills at home. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, my wife at the time, she was very supportive, but it's both of us, you know, both of us in, as, a, as a unit. So trying to make all that work is just not easy at all. Do you mind going even into the specifics of, of you know that the, those days and the, or those weeks, was it um, were the moments of tears? Were there moments of okay, I'm not cut out for this? Were there sleepless nights? You know, for the founders or, or creators listening to this, you know, I've heard from many of them that that they they always, they always push me for the specifics because I know I've had those those moments of each one of those sleepless nights, windows of, of months of, of dejection, depression, of uh, disappointment, of bawling my eyes out as a grown man because it's so mild. You feel like you're inches away and some something signals, no, you're a couple hundred miles away. Or dejection is real. Dejection is definitely real. Uh, helplessness. What are you supposed to do? What do you need to do different? Uh, also, a, there's there's a sense almost like the world doesn't believe in you, right? So you almost mm-hmm. self-pity. Like you're the only one who has it in your head that this could work and the world doesn't believe in you. And you figure you need, could, could you get that break? Is there that break that you need that you could just get and then you would make this into something special? If, if, there was a light around the corner. I guess with startups, it's, if, if an investor would just think, this is great, let, let's put some money behind this. Because you know, if they did, you would be able to make this work. And the equivalent for me, I mean, yeah, it was all of that. It was definitely all of that. It wasn't, I wasn't crying, but I, I, I felt like crying. I mean, the, the dejection was quite real. Uh, and I was fortunate. I had that breakthrough. I had that breakthrough because I was coaching the whole time for an organization that had a philanthropist, his name is Dan Rose, who loved chess, who loved what chess did for the students that were teaching in Harlem and was doing for those kids in Harlem. And I've been creating, uh, churning out these national champions and taking them to championships and turning their lives around. And the executive director of the organization said, why don't you just go to Dan? Because I shared my, my feelings with her. She said, you know, all you've done for this organization Maybe he'll help out. He, you know, he, he may be willing. He's a generous guy. And so I, I, I'm a, I was at the time a proud person as well, not, not wanting to ask for help or handouts or anything like that. Uh, but I couldn't get it done based on my financial circumstances. So I went to him, laid it out, said, this is what's going on. I would love to get some time off. And maybe, you know, if you could help, I'd appreciate it. And after some consideration, he said, absolutely, you know, I'll help you out as long as you promise to come back and continue the work for a few years uh, that you already started. And that's the breakthrough I needed because literally within 19 months, I was a grandmaster. Wow. And that's as a coach, knowing how, I imagine knowing how important that support is, that encouragement is, and still, I've never been good at asking for help. Um, and that's the strength and weakness of, of I think, um, many uh, you know milestones and many pitfalls that uh, that I've stumbled through so bad at asking for help I think that a lot of a lot of us think that asking for help is a weakness 
and it tickles at your pride. You know, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, but no person is an island. And we're, we're not wired to do things by ourselves. That's not how the human race got here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got here because we banded together against the elements. And that it's important to have that support system. It's not always easy to identify, but if you don't go out there and pound the pavement, and be someone who's able to sell yourself and to sell your vision. Usually, unless unless you had you know good fortune to have a lot of resources on your own, usually you're not going to get there because it it just takes it takes resources in order to get to to compete. That's mm -hmm. really the main point to right. compete with others who are, are using those resources and may have had them from when they were little kids. Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, when I think about it, my mother, remember my mother, A, didn't believe in chess and B, didn't have the resources. If I said, could I have a chess lesson to pay a chess coach? I mean, she barely was putting food on the table and I'm going to talk about getting a chess coach and traveling to chess events. Like, are you crazy? Mm -hmm. So, and, but, but I know many of my cohorts were easily had those resources and parents were taking them all around the planet in order to pursue chess and, and get the competition that they needed and the coaches that they needed and the like. So, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to be able to recognize that part of it is, is swallowing your pride so that you can get to where you want to get to. Yeah. I'm, as you're talking, I was trying to think through just why, uh, it, it can be so hard to ask for help. I think, um, like I said, our strengths are our weaknesses in many ways, and I feel like a pro maybe for you that uh, that pride is is this reinforcement over time. For me, it was this reinforcement over time that I can like I can be useful to my community without needing much from them in return. I want to be the one being useful to, being of service to X Y Z wh whoever's around me, and uh, and by siphoning help from them it's it's moving in that resources uh impact is moving in the wrong direction but um i think i'll it's, tell you a story please i'll tell you uh, one of the most important stories of my life was when that happened when i finally had that opportunity to get sponsorship which meant that i would have enough money to take care of the bills it meant that i was able to get a coach uh, pay a coach also travel to tournaments and also get things like a good laptop uh, to be able to get good internet, pay, pay for all the extras that I needed, databases that I needed, the, what real chess players were doing. And this, we're talking about the late nineties. So, you know, these things were, were special commodity price, priceless stuff you need to have. And so I, I found out in, because Tiger won in April of 97, I find out somewhere in May or, May-ish that I, I'm going to get sponsorship. And there was a teach, there was a principal at a school, Barbara Guy, at one of the schools I coached them. And we, we had talked and we were friends and I told her the following year I wouldn't be back. And I told her why. And she understood, right? And I said, but I have to say, I do feel a little bit guilty that I'm leaving the kids because I love this work. I love coaching kids, but I really need to become a grandmaster. And I'll never forget these words. We, we were in a taxi leaving the school late. And she said these words to me. She said, Maurice, we need you to go out and excel because when you do that, you're gonna come back and give even more. In fact, you're gonna be capable of giving even more to the community. Mm. And that just freed me completely. That I was like, wow, of course. Because as a grandmaster, I bring a certain amount of credibility. I am able to articulate the needs of the people I'm working with, of the kids I'm working with, so much better, so much more. People listen to you in a completely different way. And when I did do that and I made history and, and I was, in all the newspapers and getting all these interviews, I was able to open up a Harlem chess center. People bought into the ideas a little bit differently when you're on another tier. Mm. And that's just a fact. So 
it's not that you're siphoning from the community, it's that you are putting yourself on a level where you're able to give to that community even more so mm. because you've added to your professionalism, your credibility, uh, and, and even your ability yourself because you've made those breakthroughs to be able to go, oh, you know what? I wasn't even doing it the right way before I got to this level. Now I see an even better way to do it. Mm. And, and, and so building up yourself is just absolutely beneficial for anyone who wants to give back. Yeah, that is a great, a great story. And, and uh, that's helpful for the mental calculus of, of just buying. It's not, it's not siphoning. It is, um, it is essentially combining forces. And, and like you said, no man, no man is an island. Um, and you'll starve yourself if, uh, if you go long enough of, of thinking that you don't need help or you, um, you shouldn't ask for it. it does you also disconnect, right? You disconnect because right. what you're saying is you don't want the community to invest in you, mm. but a community wants to invest in its, its heroes or in, in its people who will be able to build the community even more so, even if only by example, right? So many people want to have great role models. I mean, there are communities that are desperate for great role models, for people they can look at and say, look, this person made it, you can too. And there's, there's, there's people power, there's, there's inspirational power in someone who comes from small town USA, uh, inner city Brooklyn, makes good and comes back and inspires those who are in the community say, well, if this person can do it growing up where we know he grew up mm -hmm. or she grew up, then I can do it too. What do we need to do to make that happen? And they're not going to do it in your field. Likely they're going to do it in other fields as well. So there is power in that. And it, and it means that the community does want to invest in its aspirational stars. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it just wants to, you know, you don't, you, you might think about the people who don't want to go anywhere and do anything. It's like, eh, okay. But the ones who are like, listen, I got big plans and these big plans are going to impact my life for sure, but potentially impact the community as well. Yeah, you go right ahead. They'll give you either financial support. They give you verbal support. They'll make connections uh, happen because they you know this, this one, watch out. This one's special. Right. You know, he or she is going places. That's what you want. You want that to be the case. In, in truth, what you're doing when you don't do that is you're isolating yourself from the very community that you want to help let's take a moment to show some love to the sponsors that are showering love on this podcast and if you want to support the podcast then you can go and check out our sponsors today's episode is brought to you by dover.com which is oh it is the founder's best friend i am so pumped about this this company this service because it is doing for recruiting what segment did for analytics instead of having to implement XYZ different analytics platforms segment was a layer on top of it. Dover is doing that for all of your recruiting tools and all your recruiting needs. So instead of having to learn this applicant tracking software, this 20, 20 different ways of sourcing candidates, this Excel spreadsheet, all of these emails in your inbox going back and forth with different tools that you're using. You just have one brilliant, seamless, simple to use layer on top of all of them. Dover will even, it will, and this sounds too good to be true, but it is one of the coolest things I've seen from any recruiting software. It'll even learn your pitch and do your phone screen interviews for you. Go to Dover.com to check it out. Like I said, it is founder a founder's best friend. Every one of my portfolio founders, their biggest need is recruiting. And when you get down to it, it's also the efficiency around recruiting not just trying to fill the seats, but doing it in the most efficient way because, well, let's face it, you're a founder, you got a million things going on. And Dover is by far the most efficient way of, of recruiting. And Dover is the best tool I've seen in this space. So go check it out, dover.com. All right, all right, all right. We are also brought to you by NetSwizzle. And I bet you heard about NetSwizzle, but you never heard about it like this. If you are a business owner, you might be making running your business way harder on yourself than necessary. Don't let QuickBooks or spreadsheets across a bunch of different files slow you down anymore. It's time to upgrade 
to NetSuite. Stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information that you need when you need it. I once heard a story that at Tesla, Elon Musk said that the one thing that they're going to be better in the world at than anyone else is that people, all of the engineers are going to be able to get the schematics for anything that they're looking for, any information they have within 60 seconds. They can find any information they want within 60 seconds. And the brilliance of that is time is money and people waiting around eight hours for information they need, you know, the marketing department or the HR department being able to see exactly the information that they need instantaneously. Well, that's what NetSuite does. Now is the time to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud business system. NetSwizzle gives you visibility and control over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, and more. Everything you need all in one place instantaneously, not even 60 seconds. Whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in revenue, save time and money with NetSuite. Join over 24,000 companies using NetSuite right now. Let NetSuite show you how your business will benefit from what they've got to offer with a free product tour at netsuite.com slash BTL for below the line. Schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash BTL. That's netsuite.com slash BTL. Maybe walk me through as a, as a coach, uh, as someone that has done it themselves, do you see people at 27, 28, or a version of you, and maybe it's, you know, it's a, a younger person at 17, 18, 19, um, take a different path that isolates themselves or that you know has all of the natural talents. What would you say are the things that that you've seen that, that take people in the other direction, not towards a grandmaster title, not towards achieving their goals, but, and, and I, I'm guessing, I'm assuming you you do see a lot of these natural talent, naturally talented, gifted geniuses that maybe don't have some of the mental superpowers we talked about earlier. But what are the things that where you'd say, oh, I've seen this a couple times before where people come up short, you know, on the mental side or in the uh, decision making side? You know, I would never say that someone essentially came up short from whatever it is from, from achieving something if they chose a different path, right? It's fair to say, because I've seen it many times, that it's probably more true that talented chess players become geniuses in other fields than they become grandmasters. Mm. You watch all, and this is what's, what's great about chess because it teaches you all these great critical thinking skills, it teaches you resilience, teaches you patience, determination. So many of these wonderful qualities, why we teach chess to young people, right? You watch them pivot from learning those qualities early on to becoming successful in other ways. Mm. And it's extraordinary to see them do that. And we have all these great people in business, right? In finance, in science. And you're, you're like, wow, look what this person ended up doing. So was it their destiny to become a grandmaster? Well, again, grandmaster is a title that's great. And being a chess professional for me has been satisfying, but it's not going to pay you millions of dollars. But I've watched folks go on to make millions and millions of dollars in their chosen profession and feel very satisfied with their lives. So I'm not going to criticize them and say, well, wait, a minute. you know, they, they came up short. They might be like, dude, you're still playing chess. <laughs> like you're the one who came up short. Right. So I think that there's the person makes their own choices mm -hmm. and they, they go along the road. And for me, every person I teach chess to, my expectation is that they're going to use the qualities that they learn from chess to be successful at their chosen profession mm. or more successful. That's my first and foremost thing, because to become a chess professional is a specific path that, that is based on your passion for this path. Not everybody's going to have that passion, but everybody can get the skills from chess and use it to pivot and become successful in, in anything that they do. Mm. 
what are some of those things that people that someone will, will learn from chess that you learned from chess that you bring into life? So I mentioned, I mentioned uh, you know, those critical thinking skills, the ability to look, recognize patterns in, in data that other people may not recognize, be able to bring together disparate looking elements and say that and that go together. And like, how did you even think of that? To be able to problem solve easily because we are professional problem solvers. When we look at a board, we, we attack the board with multiplicity of techniques that will help us to solve a problem uh, to find the next move. Uh, and to have that kind of insight into what is the right thing to do here, which is the right tool to use, a critical thinking tool to use in this setting versus another setting. Uh, to, to, to recognize when you transform one advantage into another and when that moment comes to not be stuck you know, I have to go down this path and have that flexibility of mind to go down, to, to, to turn quickly and say, we should be going down this path now. Like all, all that we were talking about is garbage. Throw it out the window. Let's go down this path. And I was like, wait a minute. I thought we had a plan. Yeah, the plan lasted as long as they needed to until it was time to turn and try a new plan. So that kind of mental flexibility is something that you have to have as a chess player. And then all the endurance qualities we talked about, the resilience qualities where something horrible is happening in the middle of it happening, there are those who will fall apart, right? They'll see it as failure. This was horrible. They start feeling stressed. But like I said, we grandmasters, we wanna be on the tightrope with somebody trying to push us off. That's a lot of stress. We live for that. So you get that, when you, when you can give that training, I've seen so many people who are talented, but when the when the bad times come, they're they're falling apart. You're like, cool, cool, cool. This is just part of the process. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to happen like this. You expect it to just be like smooth sailing. You started your plan, you drew it up, and now it's just going to be executed, and boom, the the millions are there. That's not how it works. It doesn't mm -hmm. work like that in life. It doesn't work like that on the chess game. In the chess game, the other person is like hitting your hardest plan and forcing you to come up with a better one and even another, and then here, boy, a shocking move just landed that you didn't even see and you have to adjust to. So those qualities that, that just engendered over time, you build those incredible qualities, those mental qualities uh, to, to be successful at chess. You're just very easy to pivot into life and, and have that patience as well. Patience, not as a virtue, but as a weapon, right? Where you, you're not just, I'm just going to be patient. We're like, oh, no, 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 being patient right now could make the other person blink, right? Mm. The other guy's like, is he going to go for it or not, right? Like in the negotiation, it's nothing like saying, no, I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm even ready to lose. Mm. I'm ready to walk away. I taught my daughter that very early on. Don't ever be in a negotiation when you cannot walk away. Get yourself in that position and you'll be fine in every negotiation you're in. And uh, those, are, those are just those great, frame of mind lessons that you learn when you play the game. And that is, wow, that is a brilliant, a powerful, um, and, and I've heard you talk about the metaphorical intimacy between life and chess. That's a powerful articulation of patience isn't a virtue, it's a weapon. And and it's so true. It's um, I see it in investing or in uh, in building startups. It is one of the worst things you can do is to say yes to three different initiatives all at the same time because, and I've done this, where you're uncertain about one of them paying off, so you invest in three at the same time, completely hamstring yourself for the bus of opportunity that's going to arrive, you know, three weeks from now, and you have, you don't have any bandwidth to pursue it. It's, uh, I know it's Charlie Munger's uh, partners with, uh, with Warren Buffett is famous for saying, um, sometimes the best thing to do in investing is to sit on your ass. It's that, that uh, point on patience is, is really key. I've also heard, I've also uh, heard you talk about chess teaches, teaches you to be more interested in the other. And I might be uh, getting that wrong, but to, That's right. to, to put the other uh, above yourself, can you walk listeners and myself through what, what you mean by that? One of my coaches the one who was my coach when I became a grandmaster, his name is Gregory Kaidanov. He's a grandmaster himself. He gave a great analogy. He said, imagine, this is pretty graphic, but imagine you're in a gunfight, right? And you have a, t you have a chance to take a shot. 
at the other person and you don't take the shot, what happens? What happens is nothing happened. Nobody got hurt, right? You had an opportunity and you, didn't, you just didn't take that chance and nobody got hurt. You live to continue the fight. But imagine that it's the other way. Your opponent has a chance and you didn't pay any attention to that person when they had a chance to shoot. Well, what, what happens if you don't pay attention and they shoot? Well, you just got shot and you, you die and then the fight's over. So in a situation where, it, where there are threat possibilities, right? Your opponent's ability to threaten you is far more important than your ability to threaten them. So you have to be very alert to everything they're doing, right? It's, it's like Sun Tzu said, you, you got to know your opponent as well as you know yourself. In fact, even better than you know yourself. You want to make sure you're in the mind of your opponent because they will give you the information you need in order to be successful. So one of the things that helped me to catapult to the grandmaster level is this martial art Aikido. And Aikido is not even a very old martial art. It was invented in the late 19th century, early 20th century uh, by a Japanese man, Morie Ueshiba. But the conception of Aikido is that the energy of the opponent is what you use in order to throw that person. Mm. It's a very difficult art to execute because we're used to things like American football. And it's all about bronze size. Boom, Smash mouth, right? Right. That's uh, who the person who's stronger wins. Mm -hmm. Like that's the rule. And it makes sense. But in Aikido, the person who's stronger doesn't win. The person who uses the opponent's energy is the one who wins. And so you actually have to try to completely eliminate all of your momentum in order for it to work. Because if I sense any momentum on your part, I will use it against you, right? So when I grab my Aikido sensei, the moment you grab, he feels the grab and you're on the floor, that's it. If he grabs you and the moment you put any pressure to resist the grab, he'll throw you on the floor. Mm. So you have to literally empty everything out, all the musculature, has to disappear and you just have to become energized with no, no force whatsoever and be ready to just move within the energy that you get applied to you. Now, they call this a 20 year art because it takes 20 years to get how to do this. It just mm -hmm. takes so long to train to not resist with your own muscularity. And because we, who are we as beings? Our tendency is to resist, to fight back, to, to apply our own ego and, and energy to any situation, right? That's, especially today. I mean, it's incredible. The environment we live in where, where the first thing people do is critique and doubt, like the very first. It, it, people don't even want to hear the rest of the explanation. The first thing they're gonna do is say, eh, <laughs> eh, and, they'll, and they'll tweet about it. Right. Hey, it's gonna be all over social media, why it is that you're wrong, or why it is what you're talking about is crap. And, it's, it's fascinating how, how few people first try to get inside the mind of the other person talking and really understand what they're talking about, or at least try to understand, not just refute or not just hear it on a superficial level, but understand it enough that you can actually articulate the other person's ideas as well as they're articulating. Mm -hmm. Imagine getting to that level. Imagine if we had... A, a political atmosphere where our politicians were capable of properly communicating the other person's ideas well enough that the other person would be like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Right. Instead of, no, that is not what I'm saying in your argument, it doesn't make sense, and let's fight some more, and nothing happens for the people. Right. So that is a strength in chess we have to have. Because if you make a move in chess and I don't fully comprehend it, I'm going to die is what's going to happen. I'm going to die. Imagine making a move. Imagine doing stuff that people didn't even know why you were doing it. Imagine creating a threat and nobody knew why you did that. You just win every time. Right? Uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm interested. Do, do you have moments? Did you have moments where you're like, visceral moments where you're like, shit, 
I don't understand why he just did that, why she just did that, and now I'm kind of in a free fall. Well, you struggle to give reason to the move, right? You struggle to understand it. And I will guarantee to you that there are moments you think you know why they did it mm -hmm. and you didn't understand why they did it. There was something even more subtle about the move than you even recognize because that person's operating in a higher frequency. And so you think, oh yeah, this is why. And it's only five or 10 moves later you go, oh, so that was why. <laughs> <laughs> right. I go, I was like, yeah, but now you're cooked. Yeah. <laughs> now it's over. So yeah, it's, uh, it, it happens. You know, there are layers and layers and levels and levels. Uh, I remember Grandmaster, one of the best female players, well, the best female player in history, her name is Judith Bogart. She was one, uh, made it to the top 10 players on the planet. And she, she was not able to consistently defeat the numbers one, two, and three players, right? She, she'd get them once in a while, but they beat her pretty, pretty regularly. And I was a friend to her and I said, Judith, what did, what is it going to take for you to get to the next level so you could beat them? Remember, she was number eight in the world. Mm -hmm. And she said something that completely blew my mind, like all sockets went. <laughs> she said, first of all, you mean levels. Like, levels? Plural? Like, you're number eight. One, two, and three. How many levels exist in between that, that, like, what? That made me understand how many levels I was below her right, at the time. It's, it's, a, it's a deep dive in trying to understand your opposition, hmm. really understand your opposition. And there's so much to gain from it. There's so much more to gain than you being all about yourself and your ideas, you know, what you're trying to do. Other people are are opportunities for enlightenment. Right, yeah, that I was just about to say it feels almost freeing to think about an oppositional sport or uh, endeavor as one where you're striving to understand the other the other person because it almost allows it would almost allow for almost this wonderment and fascination of holy shit, I did not see that. And I didn't in that thing five minutes ago, that move five minutes ago, I thought I knew what they were doing and I didn't. And maybe that's just from a complete spectator uh, perspective, but is there almost a freedom in rearranging it that way? Or is it just as maddening um, and, and defeating feeling to be like, man, I missed that five minutes ago. Yeah, because they're missing your moves too. Mm. So it's all, it's all of us trying to get inside the other person's head. Right. So, you you just simply are more informed you're more aware when you are looking from the other person's viewpoint as well because you can always go figure out what you're thinking mm -hmm. <laughs> you can always go back to this is what i think congratulations that's, that's the easy you get up you wake up in the morning and you know what you think <laughs> you mm -hmm. go you go to work you know what you think that's easy that reference point is done but there are billions of other creatures out there in the world, other humans out there, who you could be essentially stealing from, borrowing from their ideas that are as good as yours and sometimes and often better than yours. Mm -hmm. So why are you just stuck in your own world when there, there's just so much stuff out there for you to, to, uh, to, to grow from? Which, I mean, people are listening to us now. They're trying to get inside my head. They're trying to understand your process because it's helpful and it's important. And it's important to do in your personal life, your business life, your family life. It's important to do at every single level as you try to understand why your kid just did what your kid did. Like, let's get inside their head because it's going to make a big difference to see the world from their point of view and how they're feeling when whatever it is that you decide to do. In that marriage between chess and life, is there something in your life, professional, personal, in the last few years, few months, that you would point to and say, this this would be misunderstood, but this is why I'm doing, making this decision, because I know that it is, it's the right you know sequence for what will happen after X, Y, Z, after, and maybe a beginner 
that doesn't have the patience or doesn't have the that mental endurance or or whichever quality you've you've uh, attained from chess would miss and misunderstand yeah you know one thing did occur to me there's a there's a business alignment that I'm that I'm about there's a deal I'm about to sign the deal offers me no uh, no capital up front like I get I get nothing for the deal I get I do I get a potential percentage but I'm at a point where I could rep a company and uh, repping that company would be its own value but I'd have to let it make let it play itself out mm. right and I specifically chose this company for that reason because of what it what I think it, it's going, the leverage I'm going to get from repping this company, and mm -hmm. adding that to my portfolio. And I had a big argument with one of my younger friends, who's a really good friend, uh, who said, no, 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 you should be getting money, man. You're like Maurice Ashley. You should be getting paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it's okay. It's okay. They're not ready to pay me. They're not in a position to pay me. And me, me torpedoing the deal just because I should be getting money and, you know, be all inflated because I'm Maurice Ashley Grandmaster uh, is not the smart thing to do. Man, she was she she still disagrees with me. And we'll see how it plays out. Mm -hmm. But my instinct tells me that this is going to be a good deal in time. I just have to let it play out. Well, and you mentioned patience and learning patience and patience being a, a weapon. It it both of those things remind me of. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, so Ezekiel Elliott is. Oh no! Is, yeah, what well, I know basketball is your is your favorite sport. Who's your football team? New York Giants. Oh god, day. come on, dude, come on, you guys. Day, yeah, you guys god. fell into a couple Super Bowls, which I am jealous about. But um, the the um, I don't get. I think the other teams lost versus the Giants winning those Super Bowl wins, especially the uh, undefeated Patriots. But the um the the point that I was that comes that that comes up is is someone like Ezekiel Elliott or Emmett Smith before him, it took me probably until I was like twenty five or twenty six of watching football for twenty years before I could even recognize what people were saying around the brilliant patience of a running back. Of waiting for the hole to to open up and you you watch the the sport from the first row you even play it for a few years and you feel like oh it's all about speed it's all about running from point a to to you know the pay dirt and uh and that touchdown as fast as possible and it is it so is not about that it is this uh, confident patience i also see it in musicians i love it when a phenomenal musician just stretches out the intro of a song and doesn't give you what you think you want in, in your head, and yet it makes it so much more interesting sonically because you 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 feel this tension building and you're hooked into the song um, way more so than you would have been otherwise, or the running back is able to pick up 30 yards because they didn't pick up any for one second two seconds, three seconds, an eternity in the game of, of football, they're wait, you know, waiting three seconds before before going. And it's the difference of two yards and 30 yards, that patience. Absolutely. When I watch football, I, I see that I'm a football fan. Uh, I'm also a baseball fan. When I watch baseball, same deal, that batter at the plate, the battle between the pitcher and the, and the batter, the batter waiting for his pitch, mm -hmm. right? Don't don't get nervous. Let the moment come to you. Time it just right. You watch the greats handle that. Of course, I'm a Yankee fan, so watching Derek Jeter at the plate, just wait for that moment and then take your shot and, and then go with what they give you. Derek Jeter was a master at hitting to the opposite field, right? That inside out swing and then he's off. Patience is powerful. And a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of people listening will say, I'm not patient at all, right? Because you think aggression is the way to go, grab the opportunity. And there's timing, there's time for that, there's timing. But it, it's, it's all about that timing, but sometimes you build that tension. We, in chess, we call it maintaining the tension. Hmm. So the equivalent is um, you, could, you could either start swapping pieces, right, trading down, 
or you can let the complexity of the board continue to build. But when you're playing the game, you get nervous and you think, let me make it simpler. Let me trade down some pieces and make it simpler. When in fact, your opponent is sitting there also thinking, oh my God, it's so complicated. Maybe I should be trading down pieces. And usually the first person to blink is the one who messes up the position. So can you find that move that increases the tension, even maintains the tension without liquidating too soon? And that's usually where the power is. Very, very hard to do. And when you say trading trading pieces, would that be, um, is that just losing the tension and collecting a few pieces to make it feel like you're making progress? Is that what you mean by trading pieces? So in chess, trading pieces directly means if I have a bishop I can that can take your bishop, right? I take your bishop, you take back my bishop. That's a normal trade. Mm -hmm. A bishop for a bishop, a queen for a queen, a knight for a knight, a rook for a rook, pawn for pawn. Those are normal trades. I get something, but you get the exact same thing in return, right? When you do that, the position becomes more and more simplified because in chess, we have uh, 32 pieces and pawns or 32 units on the board. And every trade means there are less units, less things to think about because we're trading off pieces. So there's less complexity. The more that stays on the board, there's more complexity. There's more to think about. Mm. And so people get concerned when they see all this complexity on the board. They think maybe I should trade to make life easier for me to not have to look at so much stuff because it's so complicated and I can't understand it all. But the strongest players are willing, and this is a huge one I'm about to say, the strongest players are willing not only to maintain complexity, maintain that tension, but also to embrace uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know what's going to happen. Next. When it's all wild and woolly and crazy, you're not in control. You just are trusting that your process has been good enough that the situation you're in will work out okay for you. Even though it's wild and woolly, totally complex, or you don't know what the hell is going on. Full of, fully uncertain. To live in complexity and uncertainty is a profound quality every professional should have. Hmm. It will cause you not to take that quick deal because I, I, I just need a deal, right? I just, I just I can't wait any longer. I need, I need a deal right now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it will allow you to build on, on momentum or if you will, on, on the, the resources you already have. Most people when the tension hits and the uncertainty is they're ready to bail. They're ready to bail, get what they can get, they're out. To stay there for the long haul, I, I imagine the same thing as in investing, right? to stay there, to stick it out despite ever-changing environment, that's a very difficult quality to develop. And when you develop it, that's when you're a grandmaster of the game. And you nailed it on the word process. Um, it's it, when, I'm, when I help founders fundraise and fundraising for companies, I've, I've, raised, uh, I've raised capital for companies over the last 12 years for my own things um, at, at pretty staggering levels that I've never really thought I would I would ever be capable of raising capital for and even more so for portfolio founders that I'm a, um, I'm an angel investor in and help them fundraise so that's the the marquee area that I help founders with and it is this um, there's one there's a scary way of doing it which is uh, it's almost um, shying away from the uncertainty waiting and waiting and waiting and never really fundraising always kind of half you got one foot in, one foot out, not building a process. And each of the three people you reach out to at a time, when you get a no, you kind of retreat. And then you'd rather have that certainty of, no, I'm, I'll, I'll fundraise down the road. It's kind of like asking for help. I'll fundraise down the road or ask for help when I'm in a stronger position. And you essentially go away from it and and build in that, that dynamic of fear where you're like, okay, when I have this fear of, of rejection, when I have this fear of this uncertainty, I'm going to move away from it. Or you develop a process where you actually just say, okay, I'm going to reach out to 30 names and a great, and it's also not even just the process, but knowing the actual numbers, knowing that processes work, 
um, and and maybe hearing from a grandmaster talk about the process is revelatory for a young a young chess player. But if you if you outline thirty names and you and you say a world class world class um, success rate on close rate on on thirty names for a fundraise would be thirty percent. Ten people saying yes, that's world class. Thirty percent. That means you're going to get twenty no's, two no's for every yes. And emotionally, if you don't have that framework, it will sting ten times worse for every no than every yes. You fall into that that uh, doom loop of of doubt, unless you kind of have this framework. And and I remember hearing an investor tell me that those numbers, if you can close thirty percent, that's world class. That means you're probably not pricing it properly. Because really, like in a sales process, 10% close rate is, is world class. That means you're getting nine no's for every yes. But if you build out that process of 30 names, 30 firms, 30 individuals that you're reaching out to, and you have that, that you know framework, not only are you likely going to fundraise the total that you're looking for, you're also going to get some amazing, amazing qualitative uh, feedback from the no's. And, right. and you won't take it so, so personally. But it is. Uh, it also quells that that uncertain. You you're still living in that uncertainty. But that process is what you're able to cling to, rather than you know the the one off validation that that you might be seeking without without process. I think that's great point. That is so. That's uh, that's so interesting. The the concept of of uh, embracing and maintaining tension. I haven't heard that uh, on, in any conversation with a creator of of learning to embrace and maintain that tension. Yeah, it's so it's so important. It's hard. It's so, it's one of the hardest things we have to do when we play is maintain tension and embrace uncertainty. That's that's next level. That's next level because you have to implement that, right? Tactically. It's it's great to hear it as an idea, right. but you have to implement it tactically. And every fiber in your being seeks certainty. The human mind desires uh, a solution and desires the easy path, right? That's that's what we're looking for. Give me the easy answer. That's why the quick fixes on exercise fads, right? Uh, how to make that easy money, put that property. We want the easy answer. That's our tendency profoundly leans that way. We're lazy, right? Tend to. Uh, but to be successful, you've got to counter that, that natural instinct uh, to have the easy solution, to have the quick fix. And sometimes you have to maintain that tension, often maintain that tension and embrace uncertainty and be ready to be in that frame of mind. That's why it's interesting when we play chess, a lot of people want me to give insights from chess that they can use in their lives makes sense except i can i can tell you but if you don't practice it then it becomes an abstract concept only mm -hmm. that's cool let me see if i can apply it and then the moment the guns to your head you're like yeah, i'm back to what i usually do <laughs> right because you are your you are the sum of your habits mm -hmm. and what we have with chess, what I have with chess, what chess players have, is a training mechanism for, for testing and proving the ideas that we're talking about. Right. And it's important to have that training mechanism. So it's, it's easy for me to say it. Will you use it? Uh, is it? Is it different for you in the real world? Maybe I didn't say anything that you may never have heard before. But do you do it when the time comes, when push comes to shove? Again, when that moment comes, when that offer is on the table, do you you say, no, I'm cool. I can wait. I'm patient. I can embrace uncertainty. I can maintain this tension. Can you, can you have that mindset? Do you train for that mindset? One of the things we, we train for with chess is to train under extreme conditions. So, for example, we'll play blindfold chess, right? I don't even see the board. I just play the game in my head. Uh, I've heard training where you try to solve puzzles while you're in a treadmill, right? I put a, put a chest position in front of myself and I'm on the treadmill. So my heart rate's going crazy. I can't breathe. 
and, and then I'm looking at a chess puzzle. I'm trying to <laughs> break down this puzzle mentally while the treadmill is going at a pace. Do you train under pressure, under stress? Just most people just don't do those things, right? Mm. They, they want a little bit easier. So it's important to not just hear the ideas, hear the ideas, hear the ideas. It's, the, it's important to implement those ideas and train for them and right. train for them. So when push comes to shove, you've already seen it, you're ready. Maybe you've even been in tougher situations that you that you intentionally put yourself in. I, I can go on and on about this one. I don't oh, <laughs> I this... think about things like, like yeah, uh, training. Please. Like, like when you talk about when, when people in sports, you know, in tennis, do you train with the opposite hand? Right? Everybody's hitting with the right hand. You train with the opposite hand to get them sent to the brain. Same thing in sports like basketball. When you see somebody go up and use their left hand when they're a righty, and you say, how are their left hand equal to their right hand? Like, Because they train to eliminate those weaknesses. So they know their might, body might be in a certain position. Maybe it's better to switch to the left hand and to do it automatically. So they train for what's weakest about themselves. Those are the kind of things you want to do. Those are the kind of things you want to implement uh, the kind of uh, stress specific, pressure specific training. So when the time comes, you're like, dude, I've done worse than this. This is all I got to do. That is, and it's so, that is such a great qualification call out because it is hearing an abstract concept, reading an abstract concept in a book, reading advice, getting advice from someone smart, but not having one, not having the neurological pathways invested in that, that you you can actually utilize it but two also something like chess or aikido martial arts just having a a having a space in your life where you can repeatedly invest in those those pathways it's um that is so is such a great call out and it, there is such a gap between hearing a concept and being able to execute it's like telling someone just brush your teeth with your left hand see how how much of a gap there is in comfort from hearing something, thinking, oh, okay, that shouldn't be that hard to actually trying to do it for the first time if you haven't invested in in uh, those pathways. And you know what that also brings, brings us to is leaving your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Intentionally leaving your comfort zone as often as you can. When you get into systems that work for you, it's easy to get stuck in a rut because they work for you. Like, why would I need to leave my comfort zone in this area? And I'm not saying like every day you've got to brush your teeth with your left hand, or, right? Or But or, I, I would say, you know, picking up a hobby like martial arts, maybe not every day, but three times a right. week. It's, but I would, I would say, I would say you want to add something that you don't know, a new skill to your life, right? a, a different hobby. Just maybe you pick it up every year, you try a new hobby. Right? Something that will take you outside of the rut that you're in, the normal space that you're always in, so that you can feel your body a different way. Hmm. For me, I, I could like you know, salsa dancing, but Latin music. I mean, I was I was all reggae, uh, hip hop, R and B, right? So you learn to dance a certain way by yourself. If somebody's dancing with you, you dance, but you're doing your moves. And they're doing their moves and that's it. But Latin dancing is about dancing with a partner. And now you have to coordinate what you're doing with that person. And you're leading the person to do all these different moves. But you have to be connected to that person because you could just lead them the wrong way. And they're like, what'd you do? I was supposed to be going left. And you're busy going right. And so now you have to coordinate that. That's a whole different type of dancing and skill set and connectivity and coordination that you need to develop. And I can tell you how passionate I am about it now, but picked it up late in life, right? Those kinds of things give you give opportunities for learning and development that you never get if you say, nah, you know what? This is what I'm all about, which are a lot of people, not, you know what? This is what I'm all about. Well, that's great. That's nice. You're stuck and we don't right. have to talk anymore. But right. if you want to grow, get outside of your comfort zone. Amen. Yeah, growth and comfort cannot coexist, and and you cannot build a, a dynamic, a relationship, a healthy relationship with, with discomfort without interacting with it, you know, daily. Yeah, the uh, 
I picked up surfing eight months ago, 33 when I picked it up, no, 34 when I picked it up. And it was, it, it sounds similar to friends of mine that have picked up martial arts um, in that it's, uh, it is this constant dynamic with fear and you have to do these pretty counterintuitive things of you, you know, to not get wiped out. You've got to go into the wave. You have to paddle into the wave to break through it. And that is, and it is that to what you're saying, it's this, um, it's this investment in that, in that approach over and over and over again, that actually builds out that, that comfort with it. Um, and that comfort with the discomfort, but it also just allows for when it happens in real life. It's not like, oh, Maurice told me I should, I should be patient. Maurice told me I should uh, maintain uh, tension in, in, in life and in chess. It's actually like, no, I've seen this pay off over and over and over again to where it's almost that is your comfort is, oh, no, no, I've seen this pay off. I'm going to stay patient. I'm going to say no to these deals because they don't feel right um, because you've seen it a thousand times, whether it's in your hobby or, or whether it's in implementation in your life, you've seen it pay or, off a thousand or, times. Or you've, been, or you've been paying attention to it mm -hmm. in, with other people doing it because now you have a heightened awareness of this concept. So you can start seeing how it's happening with the great ones all the time. And that's another thing because if you're not paying attention to that, then you will think, like you said, you'll think that football is about force and tension and, and aggression and I realize that, that that other aspect because it's never been pointed out to you. And then when you start seeing it once, you start thinking, how come I didn't see this all the time? Right. This this stuff was always at work in the world, but because I had this mindset, I couldn't see its very existence. And that happens to us all the time. A revelation opens us up to things that have been right in front of us all along. Right. Oh, I, I, on that exact point, I would hear the phrase patience in the pocket when people would praise great quarterbacks. And I just had no idea what they were talking about until, you know, 20 years into watching and about eight years ago, it it just a light went off of, of a quarterback waiting for that extra second for the wide receiver to get a gap or, or the running back waiting for that gap to open up for them to get 30 yards instead of two. And then it was, yeah, it was this obsession. And it, I think I had seen patients pay off in my own life to the, where I was a little bit more receptive to hearing praise for patients to where I was like patients in the pocket. I kind of, I, I really want to know what they mean by that. Or you mentioning maintaining tension. It's this whole other level of, of fascination that I have with some, a phrase like that, um, advice like that. Or when you mention just the word process, it, it shoves every other word to the side. I'm, I'm so keyed in on that, that word, as you mention it, because I've seen it pay off in other realms and I'm like, okay, that is the operative term. And yet 20 years ago, I would have been like grandmaster. That's the operative term in a conversation yeah, yeah. with Maurice. Um, and a, winning. And a grandmaster is actually simply a wiser beginner. Actually, I wanted to ask you, what would be, how would you deconstruct if you saw a, and maybe it's on a, many of the themes we've chatted about, but if you were to watch a grandmaster play a beginner with all of the experience that you have, what would we see? What would you see happen in a grandmaster, an expert, play someone that is just beginning uh, in slaughter. your own lens? <laughs> this is a slaughter. Right. Well, and what, let's say it's 10 times in a row. Like what patterns are you, would you just see, know that you would see that beginner obviously lose? But what maybe even a layer deeper, what would you be seeing? What would you kind of say, man, this is happening over and over again? Uh there are so many different ways to lose a chess game that it, it, it's, it's not even going to be funny what happens. But the beginner would not spot a hundred different ways to get checkmated. Right? They just would not see it at all. They would not know to control the center of the board. The most important part of the chess board is, is the center because you can go in multiple directions. They would not know to bring their king early in the game to the side where you pass so early. They would not know to bring out all their pieces quickly because you need all your entire army as fast as possible. And you can't, you can't do like short-term scuffles, mm. right? Skirmishes. That's not how chess works. you got to bring all your forces out as quickly as you can to the center, get your king safe, avoid moving the same piece over and over, unless you simply are forced to, 
don't put your queen out there too soon because all the other pieces would start taking pot shots at it and manage your pawns well. They, they just would not know any of what I just said to do. And so their positions would just be bad in so many different ways that just would be getting their ass kicked six different ways from Sunday. It's not gonna be the same pattern. This is gonna be all kinds of ways you're gonna lose. So, I mean, that's just the way chess is. And I will tell you that even at the grandmaster level that you could be a grandmaster, but there's grandmasters and then there's super grandmasters, right? It's not an official title, but there's the, there's the people who are pretty good. And it's sad when you watch this in sports. I think it's like one of the saddest things. You'll watch someone, let's say tennis, who's number 30 in the world. And you're like 30 on the planet? You're the 30th best player on the planet? Wow, that's insane, right? Anybody who's tried to be great at anything, you're the 30th best on the planet. And number one in the world treats you like a beginner. Hmm. You can't be like, how is this possible, right? But it's it's amazing. So so when you become a grandmaster, I as I, you simply become a wiser beginner because you get to a level where you go, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm okay, but I'm really not that good. Hmm. And and everybody, but you're a grandmaster. How much you know about chess? And, yeah, but there are people who take me to school. No, I'm not. And and have that mindset of humility when you get to that point. Before you even get the title, you recognize you're just on a journey. You're on a path. You're learning. There's so much more to learn about the game. The game is infinitely complex. And all you can do is be humble, learn enough patterns to get what the world calls a grandmaster. But the world has a certain level for you. You get to that level, but you realize pretty quickly, you basically just step into an ocean and you're just trying to surf. Hmm. Well, it's as you were talking about the the grandmaster versus the beginner is just off of your previous points, just kind of rapid firing of of staying on the side. So you're staying into what you think is safer and not going into the middle, moving one piece at a time, multiple times for simplicity, instead of embracing complexity, moving your King over to the side for security and certainty or what you think is certainty, uh, versus, um, uh, you know, really actually putting all of your pieces out there for this, you know, warfare. It's, uh, it is, um, not obviously the lack of self-awareness of what the other person is even doing. Um, it's, all happening all at once the uh, but it also it makes a lot of sense that it's wiser beginner even at grandmaster because i'm i imagine that self-awareness or lack of self-awareness is is there for the beginner but for the wiser beginner there's also this vast ocean of almost awareness of where you still don't know or what you still don't know that's maybe even bigger than than the beginner that thinks Oh, it's this little territory that I need to learn, and the grandmaster is like, "Holy shit, this is seven oceans deep." Of, <laughs> of yeah, more, <laughs> yeah. Like when Judith said levels, right? Yeah. It's it's like what when people thought the Earth was the center of the universe, mm. and it's not even the center of the damn solar system, right? Right? It's like <laughs> you know about what's possible. They said there are more atoms uh, in. They're, sorry, flip it. They say there are more possibilities in chess than atoms in the observable universe. What? Correct. All right. So check that number. Wow. Imagine all those permutations. We are still studying the game. We have a long way to go. What we call it solved. A long, long way to go. And the thing is that it is not only that it has all these possibilities for us to understand the game. We have what we consider a strategic framework, ideas that make sense, like control in the center, get your king safe, bring all your pieces out, control key squares. All those are sensible ideas that you think once you master these ideas, you'll just apply them in the games and you'll be good to go. Then these damn computers show up and start playing these weird things, ideas that don't fit any normal conceptual framework. And now we're struggling to try to uh, merge the ideas that we thought we knew over hundreds of years with the moves 
that AI is just randomly throwing out, spitting out these weird things that also work, but completely go against the grain of our so-called foundational concepts. Mm. And so we're stuck again. We're in this process, chess is in this, this process in the 21st century. Where we're like, what is really going on on the chessboard? <laughs> you're, you could be a super grandmaster. And at the end, you're talking garbage. You'll hear even the best player say, I think this, this, and this. And then the, the computer be like, actually, what he said doesn't work. <laughs> and then he goes, oh, yeah. Okay, don't listen to me. Right? So it's, it's amazing how humble you have to be because the game is so infinite. And I think the same thing is true with life. I had uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, the famous astrophysicist, right. on my stream, on my stream on Twitch. And one of the things he talks about is knowing enough about a subject to know how little you know about that subject. Right. And that's how we are as chess players. Well, and if, and if listeners are taking anything away from this conversation, along with the, all of the mental qualities of, of becoming a grandmaster, I think it's, uh, I think the conversation and the points you made about uh, Aikido and chess. Um, and, and for me, it's been surfing of, of, getting into these these spaces where you're able to replicate or startups are also a great place where you're experimenting with truth but getting into these these places where you're able to apply these abstract concepts over and over and over again the great thing about a hobby is it won't have as drastic of effects on your you know professional life but that hobby I've said on, on this podcast podcast no, n- countless times that everyone uh, can and would benefit from being a, a creator whether that's gardening, whether it's cooking, uh, whether it's painting, or whether it is uh, building the next great startup, it is so valuable because you get these just daily experiments with truth and this humility that comes with it, and and this you you really develop this, you really get rid of the term I I know what's going on. You just you know, whether it's it could be cooking and you just see, holy shit, this is really hard. It starts to open up your mind on, on uh, mastering any craft around you or, or a little bit more perceptive on what it takes to get great at something um, just from those types of hobbies. But I think you're, t- you're touching on just the dynamic with uncertainty and uh, that is a whole nother reason to, to uh, jump into any type of hobby or creative endeavor because you undoubtedly are going to have these experiments with uncertainty as well. And, and then finally, just touching on, on what you just said of, of it, it sounds like, you know, the path to enlightenment is through this corridor of, I don't know. And the corridor just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It does not that to what Neil uh, seems to have uh, been saying, it, it does not get smaller. Um, it does not get, you do not become less humble the more you know of a subject. Some people do. <laughs> Some people do uh, because they haven't learned the lesson. But I think that those people are not masters and mm-hmm. grandmasters. You, you think by knowing more, you'll, you'll approach knowing all and that makes no sense. Mm-hmm. Like that just doesn't work. Chess is not like tic-tac-toe. Or life is not like like that either. Uh, the the more you know, the more the world opens up to you, mm. and the more the universe expands. And you'll you'll touch on some truth. You'll definitely touch on some truth, but you're not going to know it all in your lifetime. Well, and like you and said, you have to be fine with that, and you have to be yeah. fine with that. You have to be fine with that's the way things are. Mm. And like you said, yeah, the more you know about what you think is the center of the universe, the more you'll learn it isn't even the center of the solar system. Maurice, last two questions for you. Uh, tell me three stories that have helped shape who you've become in life, and maybe we've touched on a, on a few of them. We have touched on some of these stories. One big story is the story of Tiger Woods and my dejection with my own lack of accomplishment when I saw how accomplished Tiger was at such a young age, winning the Masters in 1997, that victory of his took me on a different road, took me on a different path. And thankfully it happened because it it allowed me to open up, drop some of my pride, uh, some some of that guardedness and ask for help. And that help catapulted me forward. 
uh, to becoming a grandmaster. Uh, another big deal was when I first started learning Aikido, that was tremendous for me to, to recognize that my overly aggressive approach to winning chess games wasn't the only way to win. That the, there was another approach that you could use your opponent's energy against them. And that in fact could even be more potent than me just trying to be the hammer banging on the nail. Mm. Uh, that is such a hard thing to learn. But once I started to learn it, it transformed my game and allowed me to play far more effectively and, and uh, get, to, get to that level, make those breakthroughs that made me eventually become a grandmaster. And then I would say the actual act of becoming a grandmaster, the actual, it, it taking place. There's a grandmaster, his name is Alexander Shabalov. He had seen me lose a game and it was a game that was really important because if I'd won it, I would have gotten the Grandmaster title. And I lost this game and he watched me play the game and I lost. And afterwards he said to me, you know, you made a mistake at one of those critical junctures, a move you made. And then he said, words I'll never forget. He said, in order to become a Grandmaster, you have to first be a Grandmaster. Oh, and what he meant by that was that it wasn't about the goal I was trying to reach. It was about the process that I was on and having that kind of personality, the patience, the determination, uh, the willingness to embrace tension and uncertainty, that is, a, that is a space you have to find for yourself before all the accomplishments come. So I had to go back and do that inner work in order for the outer manifestation to become real. And that was huge for me. And it, it allowed me to get back on the path, you know, back in the laboratory, checking out ideas and working at them and realizing that the challenge was, was not me playing at the board when the time came, but actually me refining myself before that time. So when it finally did come, I was well prepared. And that was huge for me. That is, that's a powerful reorientation of, of something that maybe for years you you thought would be bestowed upon you, and and yet it was uh, someone saying it's you've got you've got to earn it yourself uh, for yourself before it's bestowed. That's awesome. That is that is some great. That is some really wise words. I feel like that's that's uh, it reminds me of a sermon I once heard. Of I was actually in a surf video uh, with this very cool sermon overlaid on it. It was the sermon that blew my mind to a way of saying it, it basically said, uh, you've got to have the mindset to be blessed. And mm. uh, it was a very interesting kind of reorientation of the mindset to then have good things happen uh, mm -hmm. to you. And I never, it's obviously not what the conventional thought of a blessing is. Conventional thought of is from another entity to you. Uh, undeserving, and yet uh, uh, it made so much strange, uh, nuanced sense. Exactly in the same way of hearing, of hearing uh, the other grandmaster tell you, you've got to be that before you can become that. That's powerful. And last question for you, Maurice. Um, and then we'll get you out of here because this has been a phenomenal conversation. But you got other things to do. What's something you think about? What's something you think a lot about, but you rarely ever get a chance to talk about? Maybe. Uh, just personally, professionally, just something that actually takes up a good bit of mind share in Maurice Ashley's head, but just never really comes up in conversation. That's a really hard question because I'm paid to talk. Yeah, right. You're a commentator, right? <laughs> so I literally get to talk about whatever I was thinking about, and I can do that almost all the time, mm. right? If something is in my head, and I stream on Twitch, so... You got a great so channel on Twitch, about, by the way. Great channel. Thank you. I get to talk about what I want to talk about, right? That's just really cool that I get uh, something's come up. And it's like, I don't know what you want to, what you guys might see on other channels, but this is what I came up with today and it's been bothering me. So I'm going to talk about it. And when you get three hours to, to just say whatever the heck you want, it's the coolest thing. So I, I really, I really don't know, you know what I'm, what you know it's it's great not to have to hold back and not to filter you just just throw stuff out there that is great yeah and if and if uh listeners want the future proof answer of that 
go subscribe to Maurice's Twitch. All right. Well, last question. Um, where can people find out more about you, Maurice? Online. Uh, they, can follow online. On, they can follow me on Twitch. They can go to my website, mauriceashley.com. Uh, they can follow me on social media, uh, Maurice Ashley Chef on Instagram, Maurice Ashley on Twitter. Uh, yeah. And, and you Google me, I'm out there. Grandmaster Ashley, thank you so much for the generosity of insight and time today. I really love this this conversation, and and it's it's clear that mastery of your craft has has made its way into the mastery of of your mind in so many different areas of life. So thank you. My pleasure. It's been fun, actually.